emphasis, especially in, in our country. Um, so September is PCOS Awareness Month. And I think, um, you know, the, the more awareness months like this uh, is, is, is something that is, will do a lot of good for um, uh, education and empowerment, uh, both of uh, the providers and also of the, the community and the girls and women with PCOS, because this is one condition that is completely, you know, I just want to say laden with myths and misconceptions. I want to start with this um, slide today um, in, you know, in this time of the pandemic, the, the wider impact of COVID-19 on, on global health. I just want to point out that things like maternal and child health, uh, reproductive services, non-communicable diseases, all of them have taken the biggest hit and um, rolled back. I think uh, progress made in the last, uh, a lot of progress made in the last decade has been, um, you know, wiped out thanks to this because, you know, reprioritizing of resources and reprioritizing of, um, you know, the focus uh, has been on um, on COVID this past couple of years, and it's going to take us a lot of effort to, to bring the focus back to important issues like um, adolescent health and, and, and PCOS. But what I want to point out is this um, really telling slide, which our group made, is to show that for COVID-19, um, we had known about uh, diabetes and heart disease and, and cancers and physical inactivity, obesity being major uh, risk factors and, and made people vulnerable to COVID-19. But one of the things that I want to point out is, you know, PCOS falls into this group, especially after the Birmingham group, uh, Dr. Anuradha Subramaniam and others have shown that um, girls and women with PCOS are at greater risk for um, uh, COVID-19. So something to keep um, in our mind. And also probably uh, this could help actually uh, bring the focus to um, PCOS, which she needs. So um, we've come a long way. Um, from the original publication in 1935, original work by um, Dr. Stein and Leventhal, um, who described uh, a handful of women um, who had uh, amenorrhea and, and this was a time of no ultrasounds and other imaging. So we know this is from what they found um, you know, during surgery. Um, so, um, and uh, we also know about the wedge resection and how these women ovulated and many went on to have uh, pregnancies and their menstruation resumed. I mean, we've come a long way. It's almost um, 100 years since, um, since the original description. But um, in spite of all that, I just want to say that the current state of PCOS is, we know it's extremely common, and I'll uh, give you some numbers, complex, controversial, uh, costly at many levels, especially at a health system level, um, confusing um, and very consequential. So this is something that, uh, and I'll try to explain it in, 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 in this context. So it's very common and how big is the problem in India? Uh, just to start with, the population of India right now is somewhere around 1.4 billion. And 50% of India's population is below the age of 25. And the adolescent population of India is pegged to be somewhere around 236 million. And even if half of these are, um, are girls, you can see that we are talking about numbers upwards of 100 million. And any percentage of that um, will then translate into a, a huge number of um, girls, adolescent girls with this problem. A um, couple of studies, again, I just want to say the, the studies, earlier studies especially, have all included um, pelvic ultrasound, which just changes the numbers in a, in a very big way. But uh, this one is the, the prevalence of PCOS, they found to be around uh, 9 to 10%, 9.13. And in another big study from Mumbai, uh, and both of these, by the way, are community level um, uh, screening and studies. There are multiple studies on hospitalized patients or children coming to a specialist, which then, of course, is a um, you know, biased numbers. And this one included ultrasound. And in fact, their first step was an ultrasound. And we know that um, ultrasound in, in, 
in adolescence completely is going to give us um, you know, different numbers. So according to this, the prevalence was 22.5% by the Rotterdam study and 10.7% by the Androgenexis. So I just want to say that probably we are looking at numbers somewhere around you know, nine to eleven percent, or uh, you know, average it out around ten percent, which itself is very large, given that the number of adolescent girls we have. And again, to put it in perspective, I'm in Canada. The population of Canada is thirty-six million, and we're talking about a hundred million adolescent girls in India. And about even if ten percent of them have PCOS, that's ten million girls having PCOS. So. PC, you know, when should we think of something like PCOS? Is it's diagnosed in adolescents with otherwise unexplained, persistent hyperandrogenic anovulatory symptoms that are inappropriate for the age and stage of adolescence. And I think the, the, the newer guidelines have really reinforced the importance of us looking at the gynecologic maturity or the stage of adolescence as something that's really important. So it should be considered in any adolescent girl with um, hirsutism, treatment resistant acne, menstrual irregularities, um, you know, acanthosis nitricans. And I'm just saying that uh, some flags should go up in our um, in our head. And the evidence of the signs and symptoms should be especially sought out in, in patients being evaluated for obesity. And overall, as a condition, um, there's a large amount of under diagnosis, especially when uh, adolescent girls are just reassured saying things will get better if when you get married, uh, we know that doesn't happen. Um, over diagnosis, especially with the internet and, and people making their own diagnosis, over diagnosis, which also leads to a lot of, especially mental agony, misdiagnosis, which is why I appreciate um, Dr. Shantala going through the list, and I'll also talk about it, how important it is to rule out those uh, other causes and delay diagnosis. And delay in the diagnosis, again, causes a, a, a lot of um, anguish and other complications um, you know, for the girl and poor diagnostic experience. And I want to dwell on this later, why it is important for all of us um, you know, to walk the talk, meaning that if we are talking about no ultrasound, we don't do ultrasounds. If we are talking about there should not be insulin levels and OMA IR and, or AMH or LHFSH ratios, we should not be doing those because it puts our girls through um, the, the costly part, which I just mentioned, cost to the patient, cost to the community, cost to the health system. So really important that we make this whole experience for them uh, as um, you know comfortable as possible. Um, it's complex because we know that there have been several societies and we've been in this blind man elephant situation, depending upon which society you belong to uh, and which one you followed. Um, there were different diagnostic criteria, which um, you know muddled the picture um, a, a lot. Um, fortunately, we now have the international consensus diagnostic criteria. Um, so uh, I'm not going to talk much about the menstrual problems um, because Professor Mitchell is going to talk about that. Um, abnormal menstrual pattern as evidence of ovulatory dysfunction, abnormal for age or gynecologic age and persistent symptoms for uh, one to two years. Clinical and or biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism. Hirsutism, especially if moderate to severe, is a clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism. Elevation of serum total or free testosterone uh, by a specialty reference assay is biochemical, a uh, specialty lab reference assay is biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism. So as you can see, there's nothing there about uh, getting you know, um, ultrasounds. Um, there's nothing there about the insulin resistance part or, uh, or other hormones. So very simple approach, seemingly simple. What else is complex is there are presentations or um, possible presentations throughout the lifespan. Everything from a low birth weight baby, uh, premature adrenarche, the adolescent PCOS, uh, gestational diabetes, 
and subfertility presentations, um, people presenting with um, um, glucose intolerance, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease in the future, and also endometrial cancer. So the, the complexity of the condition is, 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 is part of all this is that. Plus, there are people who may present to us with the classic picture when they have the anovulation, the hyperandrogenism, and the polycystic ovaries, um, so to speak, or they may present only with either as a non pursued PCOS, or they may be ovulating, or they may um, have a, a polycystic morphology, but you know nothing much. So it's really important that th that's another layer of complexity to this whole uh, PCOS situation. The, 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 this last bit that I want to mention is also that there are, you know, 50% or more, probably more are obese, but there is the clear, lean or uh, normal body weight um, uh, phenotype as well. So both of these we need to keep in mind that, um, you know, to add to the complexity that we may have people who are uh, both lean and, and overweight. Coming to pathophysiology, um, you know, there are, it's extremely fascinating and we have learned so much in the last 20 years. I'm going to run through this rather quickly just to um, sort of uh, show where we are. Uh, so we had, we started out with this very simple understanding okay, functional ovarian hyperandrogenism, the, the gonadotropins, the high LH, um, the low FSH, and these causing the anovulation, the, the hirsutism causing the, you know, the clinical picture. From there, we then, when we learned, especially with the seminal work by uh, Dr. Andrea Duneif and others, um, that insulin resistance is a big component. And you can see now this is gelling together that there is, of course, functional ovarian hyperandrogenism, but the insulin resistance is contributing to the, the hyperinsulinism is contributing to the ovarian hyperandrogenism and also contributing to the forma, you know, to the androgen excess and, and therefore the, the polycystic morphology and, um, and, and then obesity, which is further worsening the insulin resistance and causing changes in sex hormone binding globulin and, and doing things like that. So you can see that this picture is now changing. If you want to take a deeper dive, what exactly is happening at the level of the theca cell and the granulosa cell, you can see the high LH is going to drive the, the theca cell, the whole androgen production up to testosterone. But unfortunately, because of the, the lower FSH, the aromatase activity may be impaired. And therefore you can see how that is going to impact on the estrogen, so higher androgens. Now, the insulin resistance, how does that happen? It's not just due to obesity. There is partly due to obesity, partly due to defects in insulin action, partly insulin receptor defects, the serine phosphorylation defects that we are aware of. So all this causes in insulin increase, which does two things, causes SHBG decrease, and also causes um, uh, you know, IGF BP1 decrease, which all further increase the, the free testosterone and which increases the clinical presentation of hirsutism. So now you can see how insulin is contributing. Now, um, where does all this start? We talk about PCOS being possibly a, a genetic disorder. So we really have to think of it now as a, a two hit hypothesis. So the first hit is a congenital predisposing hit, uh, heritable traits and gene variants affecting ovarian function, heritable traits and gene variants predisposing to insulin resistance, obesity and type 2 diabetes, um, congenital virilization and disturbed fetal nutrition. Really important thing to keep in mind that the fetal origin of adult disease is, is something that we cannot forget when talking about PCOS. The postnatal or the second hit is more an environmental thing. Insulin resistant hyperinsulinemia from the metabolic syndrome, the postnatal obesity, again, the, the Barker hypothesis and the Gluckman theory, um, and puberty itself is a state of um, insulin resistance. Now, what are the heritable traits? 
maternal PCOS. Uh, if you take history of the girls who have PCOS, about 25% of the moms give a history of PCOS. And some of the moms may not even know they have PCOS. Polycystic morphology, the PCOM, hyperandrogenemia, and metabolic syndrome, they're all heritable traits. So somewhere around 70%. So now marrying all these things that I just mentioned, so there's genetics, epigenetics, lifestyle, all of which are exacerbated by obesity, maybe also contributed by obesity, the low-grade inflammation, hyperandrogenism, the insulin resistance, causing the clinical features of androgen excess, the reproductive abnormalities we've talked about, and the most important that I really worry about, the metabolic abnormalities. I'm a big fan of the name change to metabolic reproductive syndrome, because I think then that will put our, our consequential problems right in you know center stage. And there are huge psychosocial problems in girls and women with PCOS, body image issues, self-esteem issues, anxiety, depression. A um, um, few seconds on the Barker hypothesis, which I think is very important. Um, Dr. David Barker talked about the fetal origin of adult disease. And just to show you when there is mismatch between less prenatal weight gain and more postnatal weight gain, and then there's fat excess in uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue and um, in visceral, hepatovisceral fat excess happens, central adiposity happens, and then that leads to a whole cascade of events, as you can see, which leads to the, 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 the PCOS phenotype and subsequently type 2 diabetes and other complications. So the, the fetal origin is something to keep in mind. And to add one more thing is the whole gut microbiome theory at every level, whether it's obesity level or the androgens or the insulin resistance, you can see many species are, um, the dysbiosis is, many species are involved, especially the bacteroides. Um, lastly, there is, though we talk about the typical PCOS, this is for the postgraduates, I, just to whet their appetite, I think they should go and, and, and read up more about this. That small percentage who may have the atypical PCOS, especially in obesity. I said it's hugely consequential. As an endocrinologist, I am very concerned about uh, this uh, you know, diabetes in women, uh, the lifetime risk of diabetes is higher in women. And PCOS is a big, con you know, driver of diabetes as much as four to seven times higher risk of diabetes in, in women with PCOS. And again, the seminal work done by Legros group, which showed us way back in 99 that, um, you know, people with PCOS have high risk of type two diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance. They showed 7.5% type two diabetes. Our group has shown as much as 13 to 15% diabetes at the time of diagnosis and at um, 35 to 40% um, impaired glucose tolerance in, um, in girls and women with uh, PCOS. I'm sorry. Um, the insulin sensitivity in PCOS, as you can see, the obese PCOS obviously has the lowest insulin sensitivity, but even a non-obese PCOS has much lower insulin sensitivity than a, 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 a normal person. So PCOS independently decreases insulin sensitivity, no question about this. This paper, I, I, I really quote often Rosenfield's paper, where they've shown that when they followed adolescent girls uh, and into early adulthood, into, in their 20s, they found that glucose intolerance was pre pre present in approximately 27% uh, of, the, of the girls. So we're talking about uh, type 2 diabetes developing in 20s and 30s, which is why um, adolescent PCOS is a huge public health concern and we should, um, you know, make all the noise about it. And um, gestational diabetes is increased. Uh, Preeclampsia is increased in people with PCOS. So PCOS should be also looked at as an opportunity for good preconception care. The other consequential, I'm just going to mention in the, for the, in the interest of time, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, at least in history, we need to ask about, um, about snoring and, and, and disturbed sleep and uh, lack of freshness in the morning, daytime sleepiness. 
uh, CV risk, so measuring lipids, um, and BMI, uh, and, and the glucose levels are critically important in, in diagnosis and, and follow-up of uh, girls and women with PCOS. So I usually say we never let them out of our sight, though um, they're not in our sight. We need to keep them in, in our follow-up throughout their life. Eating disorders are particularly common in, in young women. Um, you know, bulimia and uh, anorexia, both are common. Uh, mental health issues. Um, and anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and social adjustment disorders. And the, one of the new concepts I want to just bring in is that when young women have these, um, you know, stress and depression and anxiety, and then they get pregnant, we now are looking at stress itself as a teratogen, also leading to low birth weight, and the whole cycle repeats itself, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and these moms then going on to, and then they may develop PCOS as well, as we mentioned, the, the heritability part. Coming to diagnosis, um, you know, this is the, the, the acne, the hair growth, the acanthosis, all of this we need to look very carefully for and do a very thorough, good clinical exam. Um, it's very difficult, especially in India when women and girls are fully clothed, but we must look, you know, do the, uh, the Ferriman Galloway, at least, you know, for our records and the uh, scalp al alopecia, which is uh, the, the Ludwig score. Um, so the adult diagnosis, as you can see, is um, is so complicated because there are different phenotypes and pretty much all of them include an ultrasound except the phenotype two. Whereas with, um, um, you know, when you diagnose the adolescents, as I mentioned before, we're really talking about looking at the menstrual uh, pattern, which um, Dr. Uh, Shantala already explained, and I'm sure Dr. Richel is going to, uh, you know, elaborate on. And of course, the clinical and biochemical evidence of um, androgen excess. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier about atypical PCOS. Uh, it's something that, you know, to keep in mind, though a very, very small percentage have it. There are specialized tests that we can use to, to, to sort that out in that rare patient. But otherwise, it's um, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, which I'll come to in a, in a minute. So, um, you know, I apologize if this slide is a little bit, um, uh, you know, busy. And so symptoms um, raising clinical suspicion of PCOS in an adolescent, if it is present, um, then if they have hirsutism or moderate to severe inflammatory acne, are they on any medications like valproic acid or others that may cause this? If it's no, then you proceed with uh, biochemical testing like um, you know, total testosterone and you could calculate the free androgen index. Um, free testosterone is, is a good test. Actually, it's 50% um, more uh, accurate. Unfortunately, the measurement has comes with its own, you know, unless it's done the right way, equilibrium dialysis. And um, so th that's the reason why, um, you know, people are not promoting uh, free testosterone. Uh, and, and the total testosterone by um, the mass spectrometry uh, assays that are very, very important. And then we do the biochemical assays and I'll show another slide about what not to do that is very important. Um, and then, um, of course, we, we want to make sure that if the uh, anovulation screen is abnormal, but testosterone is normal, it's a likely disorder other than PCOS and evaluate accordingly. But if their uh, testosterone or free testosterone is elevated, um, it's just most likely PCOS and you may do additional laboratory tests to rule out other causes. So one of the things that all three societies agreed upon, I, all three societies agreed upon is we need to rule out other causes because that's so important. Some of them like Cushing's and CH, Cushing's especially, ominous, uh, you know, serious condition. So we want to rule it out. Uh, and things like hypothyroidism or hyperprolactinemia may be a lot easier to treat. And I made that quick answer of PCOS is, you know, can't cure it. But some of these conditions, we can take really good care of it. So it's important that we uh, make sure that um, uh, we, we, we come to the right diagnosis. 
Um, so um, the, the workup is pretty straightforward. So if I saw a patient and I had the clinical suspicion of PCOS and they had amenorrhea, um, especially if it is you know more than uh, three months, I definitely get an FSH to rule out premature ovarian failure. Um, I get a prolactin to rule out hyperprolactinemia. I get a TSH to rule out hypothyroidism, which itself can cause um, you know polycystic ovaries and even a high prolactin. Do a progesterone withdrawal, and then I, I, I get a 75 gram GTT. The lipids um, and the and the ALT and AST is a as a minimum workup. If there is also uh, evidence of androgen excess, then I usually add a testosterone and a SHBG or a free testosterone depending upon the lab or severity of the, uh, you know, hirsutism as well. And, and the overnight dexameth dexamethasone suppression test for ruling out Cushing's, I have a low threshold for it because the phenotype many times, you know, it's hard to figure out who may have um, uh, Cushing's and may not. So I tend to do that very often, the overnight dexamethasone suppression test. The 17 OHP and any other additional test, um, I usually reserve to make after I have strong clinical suspicion. If they come in with, they also have obesity and acanthosis, 100%, they must have uh, the GTT, the ALT, AST, the lipids, very, very important that we um, you know, do this and also get a history uh, for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, just to show you that people ask this question, are uh, adolescent values of androgens different from adult values? And as you can see, the adolescent PCOS and adult PCOS are somewhere quite comparable, which is why um, there are no you know, different cutoffs for um, adolescents. Um, so the practice pearls that I'd like to say to mention here are no role for measuring insulin, OHOMA IR, or, or, or insulin levels post Ig post glucose tolerance expensive difficult for the patient um, just adds nothing no role for AMH no role for LHFSH ratio and no role for androstene dione and and DHEA sulfate except very rarely when I'm thinking in terms of a, a adrenal uh, you know contribution, which we know there's a 30% contribution coming from the adrenal. The treatment is not going to change in a very big way unless the DHA sulfate is so high that I'm starting to think of the um, uh, an adrenal tumor. And clinically, usually they'll have features of virilization or the, uh, you know, hirsutism will be progressing rapidly or come suddenly in later on. So there'll be other clinical clues as well. And no ultrasound until eight years after menarche. Um, use, use the modified Feynman Gallery and Ludwig score for documenting the thing. So one of the things that I really like about the new guidelines is, is also to have this group called as at risk for PCOS. So if we're not very sure, um, I, and I and I, again, I, I want to thank Professor Wichel and the whole group for this caution, because there is so much overlap of phenomenal pubertal development with features of PCOS, caution should be taken before diagnosing and without longitudinal evaluation. So we can always tell the, the, the parents and the, and the girl that we are going to you know, treat you lifestyle modification, whatever else. Um, I use metformin only in people who have glucose intolerance. Um, so um, any degree of glucose intolerance. And then um, treatment may be indicated even in the absence of a definitive diagnosis. So while obesity, insulin resistance, and hyperinsulinemia are common findings, they are not used for diagnosis of PCOS. So we don't go around checking those levels either. So if we stick to these things, it can be a very cost-effective workup. So as I said before, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, look carefully, it might be a goose. So some of these differential diagnoses are important to keep in mind. Uh, Dr. Shantala has talked about it, so I won't talk too much about it, just to say there are these complete list of other conditions and very easy, a TSH, FSH, prolactin um, should, and uh, looking at a total testosterone level should give us a lead to most of them. Only Cushing's, we may have to look at an overnight dex suppression test and then additional tests if that comes back abnormal because obesity itself, you know, 
can cause a false positive test. And rarely we do an ultrasound, especially when you're thinking in terms of, you know, tumors in the um, uh, ovary or tumors in the adrenal. The management part is actually the, the uh, it's the, it's not as nuanced as all these things that we talked about, but actually uh, is something where we need the, the sensitivity and follow the evidence. So is there a special diet for PCOS? No, um, it's only a healthy diet, diet that makes people lose weight, people that the, a diet that is low in carbs and, and all the fruit and vegetables and nuts and seeds, which are good for lowering inflammation and, and, and uh, the, the insulin resistance itself. So um, again, people need not waste money. Somebody asked, how much did you lose um, uh, by after buying this book? And the answer was uh, $6. So they just lost the money they paid for buying the book. So people don't have to do that. A good nutritionist can take them through a, a proper weight reduction program. Um, in terms of, um, you know, oral contraceptive pills, are the, you know, what can I say, the, the, the cornerstone of therapy of, um, of PCOS because it works well for the androgen issues, it works well for the, the menstrual issues, and, um, you know, long, we have long-term safety record uh, and of the newer, the, the, the newer um, oral contraceptive pills are, um, you know, not androgenic like they used to be before. So uh, I think that is the way to go. The recommendation is typically to use something that has a ethanyl estradiol of uh, 30 micrograms uh, rather than the, the 20, which may not uh, you know, control the, the, the menstrual problems or the, the, the hirsutism. Um, and the other choices there in terms of the topical eflornithine can be used. Um, again, um, it's something that has to be continued. When we stop it, the, the, the facial hirsutism usually comes back. Things like GnRH agonists or glucocorticoids are uh, extremely for a you know very niche use of that and uh, has to be done by after very careful assessment and when other therapies have failed and only for a very small percentage. Um, now coming to the anti-androgens, uh, spironolactone is the mainstay, especially for adolescent PCOS. Um, cyproterone or finasteride or flutamide ideally are best avoided because of the potential for some for liver toxicity, renal toxicity, and also uh, cyproterone can cause itself can cause some weight gain, uh, fatigue, and we we do not want to expose these young kids to um, you know agents for the for the long term. And we know that treating hirsutism um, is not a uh, it's not something that we can do over a short period of time. It has, it's, a, it's long term. So, and it also takes a long time before we see the clinical effects. So very important to have that conversation that their facial hair or body hair is not going to fall off. And whatever treatment that we use, new hair will come back. The idea is that the new hair that comes back is softer and lighter and, and and comes back less frequently and their removal techniques whether it's um, waxing or um, you know threading or any epilation uh, anything that they do the frequency will become you know less and less and less so that's the goal they're not going to become you know hairless and especially Indian population, I mean, we have more hair, facial hair and, uh, you know, probably not body hair, but we definitely have more uh, facial hair. So that's something, again, we need to talk to our patients. While hirsutism is just a cosmetic issue, it's really an important touch point and um, important um, to improve the, the, the mental health of the individual, their self-esteem, which could then reflect in the way they engage in their, in their own care and um, the, the lifestyle measures that we are recommending. So I use only spironolactone and typically in combination with oral contraceptive and start with um, 50 milligrams once a day, then make it twice a day and can go up to, uh, I, I have gone, usually I go up to 200 milligrams a day. Um, the, so this is just to show you the, 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 the psychological assessment scores. 
um, in depending upon the degree of acne or or degree of uh, hirsutism, the self concept um, uh, scores and their um, depression and anxiety scores are much higher. So treating this, though it's only cosmetic, is helpful uh, for improving their uh, mental health. Uh, and finally, in terms of metformin. I use it only, only in patients who show any degree of glucose intolerance um, and um, very rarely because uh, acanthosis can be just on the basis of obesity and using it for um, acanthosis or other features of um, what we think are, you know, insulin resistance. Um, just initial lifestyle modification is, is what I want to push because metformin, uh, again, then comes in with other issues like B12 deficiency and, and it's a medication and how long to give it, what happens if they get pregnant, all these questions, you know, come up. And so in, in these two studies where what they found was both lifestyle modification and oral contraceptives reduced androgens and increased the SHBG in obese adolescents with PCOS. Metformin in combination with lifestyle modification and oral contraceptive reduces central adiposity, reduces total testosterone, increases, does not enhance overall weight reduction. So uh, we could use it in patients with glucose intolerance we might get benefits like regularizing of their cycles, maybe even an ovulation. I mean, they, are, they might start ovulating. So need to be careful about prescribing contraceptive as well when we prescribe these insulin sensitizers. My last two slides, uh, I look at PCOS as the low hanging fruit um, for a lot of things. Uh, this, we, I just mentioned the beginning of my talk, the number of girls and women um, who have, uh, by the way, the number of women in reproductive age in India is over 300 million, 15 to 49 years. So we could really use this as the low hanging fruit for public health measures, for counseling on uh, a, a life course approach to good health, uh, for counseling on preconception care, um, for at, at every level and prevention of chronic disease um, in, in women later on in life. So for all of these things, I think this is a, a great um, life course approach and, uh, and, and you know, should be used uh, for preconception care as well in a, in a big way. Uh, thank you so much again. I've stopped sharing the slides. Thank you, Usha. That was a very comprehensive and a very detailed uh, review. And I think you answered quite a few of the questions, even if we could request you to answer them in the chat box and the sure. Q&A, uh, that will help. There are a few more questions about uh, OCPs and lots of things. Sure. Although you've covered quite a lot, yeah. You've covered quite a lot. It was a very good, um, talk on polycystic ovary syndrome. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I hand I it over it. back to Shela for the next one hour session. Thank you, Shela. Yeah. Uh, Preeti, we could take a couple of questions because. Right. Uh, do you, I thought. Uh, yeah, I know, but. Time? Fine. Do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one is, what is the role of exercise in PCOS apart from weight loss? Oh, um, exercise is um, fantastic in terms of improving insulin resistance. So uh, any, um, uh, you know, patient that we, um, and, and in combination with a good diet, even for weight reduction, uh, exercise is, is really important. Increasing lean muscle mass, uh, we know increases the uh, insulin sensitivity. So uh, it's, it's a program of um, healthy eating and uh, physical activity that we need to prescribe to these. And, and it's also sets us up for a lifetime, lets the, sets up the girls for a, a, a lifetime healthy trajectory. Yeah. The other one is how to treat uh, NAFLD. Uh, sorry, I think we'll take this one. If OCPs are absolute, absolutely contraindicated in a patient, how to address that? And what is the lower age cutoff, especially in younger girls to start OCPs? Um, so, um, 
if they, you know, not only they cannot take it, I mean, they will, um, they have issues taking it. So there are some mothers, especially who just will not, um, you know, sign on to the program of giving um, oral contraceptive pills. So um, then we, we really are left only with the lifestyle modification and metformin and, um, you know, anti-androgens. Um, which is uh, again uh, very careful about um, in, in potential possible pregnancy. Though teenage pregnancies are, um, you know, uh, not that common, but it can happen. So uh, that's always something to keep in mind. So uh, it, it's it's an opportunity to push the um, lifestyle modification in a big way and and use uh, metformin where uh, where necessary. Uh, and there was one more, Shela, one more or? Uh... Yeah, one last one you can take. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you talked about a relation of PCOS and COVID. So somebody has asked, is it because of obesity, which is a pro-inflammatory condition? What is the uh, relation of PCOS so, and COVID? Great question. So when, the, when these researchers looked at it, they looked at, you know, took out the uh, confounders like BMI or, or um, diabetes or other things and still found that PCOS um, increases the risk.